Good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us for part two of a Housing Forward Mass's Advocacy for All training it's called Amplify Your Advocacy. My name is Josh Zakem. I'm proud to be the Executive Director of Housing Forward and to welcome you uh, to our program today. It's so exciting to see such a high level of interest from committed pro-housing activists like all of you in learning more, engaging with each other, and building a pro-affordable, pro-workforce housing movement uh, across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm really excited that once again, we're joined by Kristen Halbert, who's gonna facilitate uh, this session, training and answer all of your questions. Thanks again for being part of this. Please make sure to follow us on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, uh, and check out our website where this training session uh, recording will be posted. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Excited to get into it. And here's Kristen. You know, if this was a TikTok video, we would have just like done that thing where you just jump in and suddenly it's a different person. But this is real life and I am really excited to be here with all of you guys. So if you uh, were here yesterday, you might have already seen my face. But again, my name is Kristen Halbert. I'm a local activist, organizer and trainer specializing in helping people kind of level up their advocacy and the way that they engage with some of our systems here in Massachusetts. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about amplifying your advocacy and having an effective communication strategy. So again, very excited that you guys are here with us today. And let's just get started. All right. So um, having an effective communication strategy is incredibly important when we're trying to advocate for ourselves or for our community. And we're going to review a little bit about not only how to make a good effective strategy, but also the best ways that you can engage politicians, your communities and others in order to make sure that you're being heard. And what do we actually mean by this? Because I think it's helpful when you engage with something to make sure that you're actually naming it. So when I say advocacy, I mean the act of taking a position on an issue and initiating actions in a deliberate attempt to influence private and public policy choices. So this means that it's not just the advocacy that you see like marching down the streets or like banging on doors. Like some, It literally is just taking a position, standing up and saying, this is how I feel about any issue is an example of advocacy. So if that's where we're setting the bar, I'm pretty sure that there's everyone on this chat has advocated at some form or maybe not at the state house, maybe to your own family members, advocated some position for yes or for no. I'm sure a lot of people are going to have some advocacy practice next week at Thanksgiving. And when I talk about policy, I actually mean just how the government is responding to an issue or problem. That means it could be laws, it could be regulations, resolutions, funding. All of these are different public policy choices that our electeds can make that are important to their constituents. And they will look at them as if a lack of action may threaten their ability to get reelected, which is one of the biggest powers that you have as a constituent. So again, whether that response is any of the options below or something else, it's your advocacy that's gonna help choose the right response for your community. But if these are all the options that you could have, how do you actually know what the right response that you're looking for is? So one of the best ways to do that, just get informed. One of the first things to do in order to feel prepared is to be informed. And it's important to make sure that you have a baseline understanding, not only of the issue, but the actual community and people that it affects, the major players in the game, and legislation that's being proposed to fix it. One of the best ways to do this is to read articles and coverage of the issue from a variety of sources. This includes print, television, radio, internet. And when you're reading articles from reputable news sources, like your local papers and national news sources, just make sure to take some time to click the links that are associated to associated articles inside those sources, especially on the internet, because that might provide new information, different viewpoints, and even different lenses that will be important for when you craft your own argument. We always like to say that a person is best prepared when they actually can answer any question about the uh, subject being asked. If you come in and you only have 
your deep emotional feelings about an issue, that is absolutely valid. But in order to make a argument, discussion, or to change someone's mind, it's always best to be prepared with a couple of facts and just, again, this baseline understanding of the issue at hand. But we want to make sure that when you look for those sources that you're looking for the best ones that you possibly can. Here are a couple of questions that you should definitely ask when you're looking at a source that might be a new one or one that you have not engaged with or one that you might find a little bit questionable. Like, does this article include statistics that you can find in other articles? If you were reading something on housing production and one article from the New York Times had cited a 22% statistic, but you saw something in a lesser known, maybe less well-traveled website that repeated that statistic as 64, that would be a very, very large question. So you would have to actually click on those links and see, does the 22% actually come from a study, probably from a peer reviewed journal for the New York Times? Does this 66% statistic actually have no citation listed with it and I can't actually find where they got it? Anytime someone lists a number, but you cannot tell where it came from, it is definitely a sign to kind of take a step back on taking that as an appropriate source. Another one is, is the audience in the same field that the issue is in? Let's say that someone writes an article and it's about development and they are using some language that you think is a bit inflammatory Think about the person who's actually writing the article. Is the person that's writing the article, are they a local neighbor who may not want anything built inside of their area? Are they a developer who is looking possibly to bypass a certain process of like maybe a neighborhood association meeting? You always have to think about the person who is actually writing and giving you any of this information because as much as we'd like to believe that everyone's just there to educate us, some people are actually there to sway us instead of educate us. And you have to be looking at all of these different types of bias because we are in an age that has a whole lot of information and some of the responsibility of making sure that that's the right information is definitely gonna come on the reader. And I'm hoping that everyone feels a little bit more prepared to look and discern those types of information with this training. And also, if you look at those handouts that were sent to you, um, along with the link to this, you can actually see some of the quick things that you should be asking yourselves. And I will be referring to the handout a couple of times just to remind you that things that I say, even if I say them quickly or move to the next slide, a lot of this information is available at your own perusal in your own time. Okay, I will like to say one thing though, just because I know I'm saying a lot about checking all of these sources. There are also some things, we refer to them as peer reviewed journals, which are academic sources where people submit their articles or their research and is actually reviewed by other people to make sure in the same field to make sure that it's valid. Now, peer reviewed journals can be expensive. They can require memberships or signing up. But if you go to certain websites, people are just very dedicated, similar to how Housing Forward is actually giving you this training right now, they're dedicated to making sure that education and advocacy gets out there. So if you would like to look at a couple of free peer review journals, I would suggest that you go to the directory of open access journals. Now that's doaj.org for directory of open access journals, where you can actually search and read direct scientific articles and data for free. Occasionally, yes, you will also find free links inside of these articles, but just to let you know, doaj.org is an excellent resource if you want to really level up on that scientific information. All right, but just really drilling in just a couple of those um, quick points about things to look for, very suspicious signs when you're engaging with different articles. All caps headlines, I think we've all seen those and knows that those are pretty suspicious. Uh, anything that uses derogatory or heavily inflammatory language, emotionally manipulative headlines that have more to do with how people feel rather than the issue at hand, and as well as any kind of site that makes an unsubstantiated claim, like we're the best, number one, but no one gave them an award, they gave the award to themselves. Well, we're not here for that kind of self glad handing. We're actually here for, again, peer reviewed information. And also 
also any domain names that end not in .com, .org, .gov, or um, a traditional one that you've heard of, anything that might be, if you see like newyorktimes.com.io, well, that is most likely a phishing site and you should not click on it. Anything that seems like it has a normal middle, but that end is questionable, you're gonna wanna steer away from that site or anything that led you to it actually. But sometimes, eventually, we do want to stop reading and actually connect with real people, even in our virtual spaces. It's really good. I just want to say, all of you that have your face, um, your actual screens on, I can see you. I'm waving at you. I'm so happy to see you. Ah, thanks for waving back. So happy to see you tonight. So if connecting with people on the ground is what works best for you, you're going to look to your local community leaders in the field for guidance about efforts that are already underway. Anytime that you join an effort it already that already exists, it really ensures that you don't step on any toes and that it may be more efficient because there's a lot of strength in numbers. So a few examples of ways that you can do this are like local nonprofits, uh, regional chapters of your national organizations. It could be neighborhood associations, mutual aid, uh, social justice meetup groups, or even book clubs that are related to your issue. Because many times when people do read things, especially when they're reading things long form, they would like to get a little bit more involved in the advocacy for that area, especially if you're reading like uh, anything that's from uh, reality or true life or a study. So I really do advocate a lot for people to actually look for people who are just reading books inside the field that they want to be engaged in. It's a great way to find community and meet new people. Uh, you can find many of these events, organizations, groups on your traditional ways. So I would say things like uh, Facebook events feature, searching directly through causes. Uh, oh, that's strange. One second, guys. Hey, did uh, did you guys lose the presentation? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, while I bring it back up, I am going to continue to uh, still talk with you guys and stop that share for a second. So you do still have the ability to go to traditional ways that you can um, find community. So traditional ways, again, could be Facebook, community bulletin boards, and things like that. But non-traditional ways that you should really look at are sites like meetup.com, which usually people would use to meet in person, but has also switched to having a lot of virtual events. And I would also say that you should really search Eventbrite. I know that people generally go to it because they're um, in places where uh, they just already are going just to buy a ticket. But if you actually search through Eventbrite and also search through their causes feed, Feature, it can be really important and a great way for you to find other things that are happening in the same fields and the same issue areas. And our last one that I'm going to suggest is to make sure that you follow trusted organizations on social media. It's one of the best ways that you're going to stay up to date with any events that they're going to be hosting. For example, you can actually find Housing Forward MA on Twitter at Housing Forward MA or Housing FWD MA. And you can We are going to do a quick technology switch here, and you guys will. Hey, guys, we're just going to switch computers real second. So one second and bear with us.
back. I gotta... You tried so hard. <laughs> don't do it. Shit, I just... <laughs> okay. All right. You're back. Hey, guys. I guess I'm going to be drop taken for the rest <laughs> of this evening. Lucky me. Hi, the audio is out. Sorry. Kristen. As quickly as possible. Hmm. So, well, some of the ways that you can do this is definitely reading executive summaries for some of our studies. You are, can look at fact sheets, also frequently asked questions or one-on-ones. And they're obviously, you're here right now for a free advocacy training. So definitely keep attending items like this. Uh, organizations. And any organization definitely wants to be um, make sure that you are an informed member of the cause. So um, I'd also like to use this moment to tell you that there is a great resource page over at housingforwardma.org. And you should definitely go there for things like videos from this training, as well as other resources like frequently asked questions about development, as well as anything else that they have upcoming on their calendar or legislation that they might be engaged in. So very much encouraging you to engage with the local people who are already on the ground. So once you've engaged, once you've leveled up, you found your organization, you found your issue, you found your community, and you found some information, what are you going to do with it, guys? I have an idea. I would say utilize it to make change inside of the world. And there's really kind of a limited window for you to get point your get across your point in like a public meeting or a conversation or an opinion piece. I mean, we learned yesterday that sometimes when you come to a public meeting, you can have anywhere from only 90 seconds to two minutes to get your point across. So I'm going to help you with a couple of different ways to really hone down on what your message is. But additionally, if you have some more time, ways that you can like expand what you're thinking about and expand what you want to share with others. So we're going to do, not live, but I'm going to run through an exercise in narrative building. This is a really great way, especially if you're new to a subject or you just have a lot of thoughts about it, to kind of just get everything out there. Because the best way for you to figure out what your best argument is, is to actually go through all the different aspects of it. So this is a would be a five minute exercise for anybody, well, seven minute exercise. So the first thing that you would do is you would make a list with two columns. One column you're going to put pass. So what would the effects of the legislation be not passing uh, due to you and your community? 
On the other side, you're going to say, what would the effects be if their legislation actually passed? And you're going to set a timer for five minutes. And if it's very complicated, you can set it up to 10. But I really do advise that the shorter times really um, lend itself a lot better to writing. And you're going to write down any outcomes, whether they are guaranteed outcomes that you already know about and have found proof, or whether they are speculative outcomes that you maybe do not have hard proof, but you do really feel that this is probably going to be the outcome that happens. Um, never think that anything is too crazy or too weird. You could go down a path that says, if this, if my trash collection doesn't change from Monday to Friday, then if I don't throw out everything on Monday, then I'll be overrun with trash and and then I'll have rodent problems and I won't be able to actually handle anything or hosting over the weekend because I may not have the trash from last week. Just go all out in those five minutes on whatever it is and make sure you do it for both sides. And at the end of those five minutes, when that timer goes off, um, you're going to look and read through each side and highlight which of those arguments are actually compelling. There is something that you wrote in there when you were just pouring your heart out for either side that is very, very compelling and true and that you will read and you will want to come back for. Or you'll read it and remember that you have a statistic already in mind that was also a very good statistic that you could tie to that particular argument. You should do this for the side that you want the outcome for, but don't forget the other side because the other side is going to tell you what you already know in your heart as the strongest arguments against the outcome that you are going to want. And if you want to do a little bit of advanced work outside of just advocating for your position, you can also show why the other position might be uh, damaging to your community, your personal home, or to your neighborhood. And by that, you can just look at those um, reasons that it would be good for it to either pass or not pass, whatever outcome that you're looking for, and make sure that you find a little bit of evidence that disproves those reasons that you thought to put down because you thought that they were also good reasons that someone would bring up. It's really, really huge to know both sides of the story, guys, because it's going to make the most compelling argument and the most compelling line of talking when you're engaging with new people, your legislators, or in those community groups that you're already in and already uh, engaging with. So um, once you found those your best cases, I would suggest you pick two to four of your favorite and most strong arguments. You're going to build upon them. So you're going to search the articles that you've already read, you're going to search for quotes, and you're going to look for statistics, and you're going to look for things that particularly enforce your points. And again, it you could necessarily find great statistics for every single thing that you have, but you really do have to hone in on those two to four arguments that you keep coming back to as really compelling arguments. If you're having a hard time deciding, try bringing another person, even if they don't know the background information, into uh, your circle and have them look at the document and have them just read and say, I really vibed with this one and I really didn't like this one because maybe those outside eyes are actually gonna get you a better argument at the end. But again, you don't have to do this or share this exercise with people. This is only if you feel like you got stuck and you feel comfortable sharing this with another person. So lastly, once you figured out your best ones and the statistics around it, see if you can actually search other articles, maybe in the doaj.org or even on something as straightforward as Google Scholars to see if people have made that same argument and you augment that again with your quotes and statistics of combining those arguments that might have a little bit more meat to them with your personal arguments or your personal anecdotes or stories because those are really what like um, drives a lot of change for people is the personal aspect of it. And once you combine those together, you should have a pretty great outline for making a great argument. And I'm thinking of argument in terms of a traditional uh, five paragraph essay. Could I get some hands up of those either in the chat or those people who have their cameras on of who is uh, referred to a traditional five paragraph essay when they were in grammar school? There. <laughs> I knew I'd have a couple people. So you might be familiar with this format already, but when we're using it for something like advocacy, we're going to change it around like just a tiny little bit. So your intro, um, where you would normally just defend, is actually where you're going to identify yourself as a constituent and including your address, word or prefix.
Precinct, you can find this information if you don't know it already at whereDoIVoteInMay.com. And you're also going to name the bill, ordinance, or issue. You can find your bill numbers and your ordinances if you're going to head over to uh, your clerk's website. And just a reminder that the clerk's website for every single city and town in Massachusetts can be found on the Secretary of State's website. And you're going to state what are your, prefer your preferred outcome for is. So I might say, hello, my name is Kristen Halbert. I live in Roxbury in Ward 12. And I am reaching out to you today about the ordinance to change all trash collection days to Friday. I think that it is a horrible ordinance that will only seed malcontempt and anger amongst my neighborhood. Something like that. I wouldn't suggest using that one. I actually love Friday trash days. I think they're great. But <laughs> something like that kind of intro. And in your body, those three paragraphs in the middle, you're going to start with your absolute strongest argument as your first paragraph. That should be your best. That should really be the thing that after you introduce yourselves, catches the reader, whether it's a personal anecdote about how this will happen to you, what will happen if this passes, or it could be something that just has the strongest statistics behind it, or it could even be something that already has the strongest amount of public support for that particular argument, but that should be your first paragraph. Your second and third paragraphs get weaker unless you are one of those A students who decided to really delve into the opposition argument from the last exercise, in which case, please make your third paragraph um, a rebuttal. So you would have how you want your outcome in the first paragraph, one, two paragraphs of very strong arguments, but then that third one is a just a right hook to whatever argument that you think is going to be against it, again, using the research that you had from the previous exercise. And in your closing, just make sure that you really make a final plea and restate your strongest argument and give them a call to action. Maybe your call to action is please don't vote for this. Please, as your constituent, I'm asking you not to vote for this. Or your call to action could be to have them write a resolution. Your call to action could be to have them to host a hearing to investigate why there is no affordable housing on an entire side of your city. <laughs> like you, Any of these things can be call to actions. Anything that is one of those things that we learned at the beginning of what a public policy response is can be a call to action that you give to your legislator. You can also make this into something like an op-ed if you feel very strongly about it. And then your call to action could either be to your legislator or it could be to your fellow voters to join you in this fight, write their own op-eds or make a call in co uh, campaign to that legislator to make sure that they vote in the appropriate way. All of this can is able to happen because you took the time to actually solidify your argument, learn about the issue and engage with it. But if you feel this positive and you feel this good once you actually have your argument and you know what you're about to say, I would love it if the second step of engagement wasn't just talking um, to your legislator or to the public through your essay, but actually engaging in the gold standard of engagement, which is one-to-one -one contact. So let's go over a couple of ways that you can do that best. Now, as I stated at the beginning, the best way to be prepared for anything is to learn about it and to get as much background information as you possibly can. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can learn about your legislator. Because how else would you know if the legislator is actually amenable to a cause that you're passionate about? There are actually many, many, many ways that you can learn that, guys. So one of the best ways to engage with an elected official is just use the avenues that they have created for you. You see, your legislator already has previous legislation and has already um, made a stance on a lot of issues. So you should always go back and see what their actual record is before you engage with them in something new because they literally already told you how they might feel about it. If they, would you, if they are new or they haven't actually legislated on something that you care about, you should definitely try to check out their campaign website or their newsletter where they're going to share with you what they feel is most important to them. Now, many people on their campaign websites put everything from their values, their issues, their policy platforms, and a lot of other information that is very helpful for figuring out how a legislator is coming to an issue that you might not necessarily be able to find just skimming through articles 
or just through general uh, coverage or minutes from meetings that they might have been. You can, though, look at articles that specifically cover their work and the kind of quotes that they are giving to see if they might be amenable or not amenable to any certain issues, as well as looking at those trusted nonprofits legislator scorecards and any other nonprofits that might have engaged with them that you are comfortable with and that you trust are great ways to learn a little bit more about how a legislator has previously engaged with an issue, especially how they've engaged with it in regards to the advocacy community, which can be very different from how they might engage with it from a one to one constituent basis. The last way that I would probably suggest, which is the easiest and probably one of the most fun ways is social media. And I definitely mean like your Twitter, your Facebooks, your Instagrams. I know we even have some of our electeds on LinkedIn just because they want this many ways to connect with you and learn a little bit more about you. So because social media can get a little bit sticky, we're going to cover that kind of like directly right now. It is a unique opportunity to engage with your elected. And many times they'll actually pose questions to you and it'll be a great opportunity to share how you're feeling about an issue in the district or perhaps to answer them, but give your own follow-up question about what's going on so that you can actually establish a relationship before you even actually meet them or see their face. They could, you could be fast friends on Twitter before you ever actually set that meeting. And that's an excellent way, again, to develop a relationship with your legislator so that you can feel a little bit more comfortable and there's a little bit more back and forth when you're engaging with different issue advocacy. So I would suggest that a great way to do this is to build rapport and make a habit of commenting and engaging in any of their posts, as well as you should share the content that you actually agree with. Um, and if you should actually also share content that you don't agree with, because you should let them know why you may not agree with them and they in a respectful manner, and they may actually reach out to you about why you don't agree just to learn a little bit more about your stance. I mean, this is also a great opportunity as you engage on social media to learn about how they approach everything. Have they recently posted? Have they recently commented on something that would suggest that they feel strongly? It's not just what they post directly. It's also how they have engaged on other pages and how they have engaged with other electeds about this particular issue. You're also very likely to get an answer uh, quickly directly from a legislator if you do approach them on Twitter. And it might be a way that you can go about something if you feel that you're not getting a response in your traditional matters, like your emails and your phone number or your emails and your phone calls. You might want to take it to social media to see if you can get an answer a little bit quicker. Now, again, I love this. I love this little uh, emoji that I have here in the side, because again, advocacy can be very, very, very frustrating. And the number one thing that you can do to be great at it is actually just to keep your cool as much as possible. So if things escalate, which they very well can, um, because you can just feel very strongly about an issue that affects your day-to-day -day life or an issue that affects your family or your neighborhood or community, just remember that it's okay to walk away. It's okay to take a second and to take a nice little in real life and virtual breath to collect yourself because it's the internet, it's social media, it will still be there when you come back, I promise you. Um, and you should always make sure that you take that time to collect yourself because you're gonna wanna stay clear of things like personal attacks or anything that makes it more about the elected and themselves as a person or a personality rather than something that focuses on the policy or the issue at hand because that is really what you came to debate them about. If it does get a little bit too thorny and a little bit too heated, especially because things like Twitter, Facebook are an example of the public comments where everyone can kind of jump in and you can end up in a little bit of a dog pile situation, even if that's not what you meant, you should try and take it to the DMs, which is another way of saying use the instant message function, whether you're using Messenger on Facebook, direct messages on Twitter or Instagram, or just sending them a follow-up email, or if you're lucky enough to have their phone number, a text, try to take it off into a way where it can just be a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and you can de-escalate that situation instead of continuing to have a public argument where the politician might feel that they have to defend a position, even if it's gone into a way that they necessarily don't feel like or you feel like you have to defend your position because you don't want to lose to somebody on the internet. 
make sure that you always remember that the entire goal of engaging with somebody is to establish a relationship is to establish a give and a receive in this. And the way to do that is definitely to come as respectfully and thoughtfully and gracefully as possible. But again, I completely understand that these can be emotional times and that everyone feels a little bit that they're at their wits end, especially when they get into an argument online, which is where most of our interactions are happening right now. So I really do advocate for just taking those quick beats deep breaths in and out, try for three deep breaths in and out with feet planted on the floor, open chest with your shoulders back. And just really after those three very deep breaths, think about what you were writing and whether that's how you wanted to go into this relationship with your legislator. There's a good chance that you might want to rewrite whatever you were typing. The last thing though, is if you are in that kind of argument and you are keeping it in public commons, you might actually find that you have some people on your side. Keep track of who else weighs in if some other people join in your conversation with their own comments. It may be the leader of an organization that you should be connecting with, or it may actually be your own neighbor that you should try to have a talk with. Always make sure that you keep track of everything that you do when you're in a public commons space like like social media, or if you were testifying at a hearing, just to make sure that you're aware of all the other players who might be in the game, even if you didn't know they were there in the first place. So let's say that you actually go through this, make your argument, you feel confident, and you really want to meet with your legislator. Let's be honest right now and note that that is probably going to be over Zoom. We are not really at the point of physically meeting with our legislators yet, but these tips will work for you whether you're meeting with someone virtually or whether you're meeting with somebody in real life. So if you're ready to take that next step and meet with them, it's really important to set those appropriate expectations first if you've never done this before. So many times you're actually going to be meeting with a staff member and that staff member's job is to listen and understand your concerns so that they can bring them to the legislator on your behalf. I wanna let you know that as a former staff member myself, this is actually a great outcome. As a staffer, I would have a lot more time than my legislator would to actually listen to you and make sure that I was getting the, the full picture of what was going on in your community or in your neighborhood. And then to make sure I had all the background that I needed to make a nice, clear, concise case when I went back to my legislator. So I might actually know him or her a little bit better than you guys. And so I might know a great way to make sure that they actually go and engage with this issue while it might not have worked out the same way if it had just been a one-to-one -one meeting with just the um, with the nonprofit group or with a particular constituent. So I want to say if you get to meet with a staff member, just be really excited because that's a person whose whole job revolves around making sure that they have listened to you properly to bring it to the legislator. Now, if you get a staff member or even if you get the legislator, they might not be experts on the issues, even if it is an issue in their district. And just I ask that everyone would have grace and patience about that, just because there are a lot of different things that happen to be on their schedule and on their minds, and they may not have had a chance yet to learn about this issue, but I guarantee that they are incredibly thrilled that you learned about the issue and brought this information to them. So even if it's a staff member or the legislator, they might not know about the issue. And also when you wanna meet with them might not be the time that they are available to meet with you. There are times, especially around budget season or high uh, needs legislative season, or perhaps around a, if there's a urgent issue that is happening in your city, municipality, or in uh, the state, that they might not be able to take meetings as quickly as you might want. It might be that you have to wait anywhere from one to three weeks until you actually get that meeting, but know that even if it's pushed out and it is still something that they want to do, just be patient and make sure that it isn't dropped from your calendar and check in with them at least once a week just to see how things are going about that follow-up and about getting that thing on the schedule. You also might have a shorter time frame than you might have prepared for and I want to make sure that when you go and ask for that meeting you are asking specifically how long that you think you're going to have with them because the last thing you want to do is show up with a 10-minute argument to a five-minute meeting because <laughs> 
you may you may skip over points that you really thought were incredibly important or that were particularly poignant just because they were at different parts of your argument. And it's very hard when you're on the spot to condense something literally in half that you had already spent a fair amount of time practicing with. So make sure that that's one of your end questions whenever you're scheduling one of these uh, um, meetings is, how, I just wanna know how long is our meeting? Is it five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes? If there's something where you feel like you need a specific amount of time, please make sure that you explain that to the person why you need that specific amount of time. And you might have to wait longer, but you could actually get it. But it's really all about uh, transparency when you're coming about what you need at any given time. And you should feel fine asking for that. I know that this is something that a lot of people need to get used to, but you should always feel fine asking the legislator the worst thing that they can do is say no, but the best thing that they can do is give you more time to make your argument, direct meetings face to face, and actually vote or engage in the way that you want for your public, public policy solution. But none of these outcomes can happen if you keep your mouth closed, guys. So make sure that you are just making those asks, even if they seem a little bit difficult. So before you set go to your meeting, I just want to make sure that you guys are set up for the most success possible. So when you're asking for your meetings, always start by requesting it in writing. I know it's like, I saw this issue on the channel five news and I have had it up to here. And you just want to pick up that phone and say, I, Mayor Walsh, I just want, I want to talk to you right now. I, I want this meeting this, this very minute. Well, I mean, you might get it honestly, but <laughs> I'm going to suggest that you always put those requests in writing first so that the staffer and the legislator actually have something to go back and refer to about when you ask them and what you ask them for. And additionally, it also gives you a great ability to just follow up with a call 48 hours later if you haven't received a response back and say, hey, I sent this thing in writing. I've created this paper trail to your office that I as a constituent wanted to meet with you and engage with this particular issue. Probably don't see the paper trail part, but I'm just letting you know what you've done <laughs> is create that paper trail and ask them um, just how they are as far as scheduling, because it might be that they did not see it. It might be that they did see it, but it might be for a scheduling meeting like the next day that um, after you called. So it's perfectly fine just to make sure that you follow up to make sure that things didn't fall off of their plate because you are a very important item. <laughs> um, as I said before, confirm the length of the meeting time and make sure that you are always saying thank you. A lot of people only engage with certain offices when they are very upset. And those little thank yous and periods of grace and thoughtfulness go an incredibly long way in government which is a place that as much as I'm talking about process is very, very guided on relationships and how people interact with each other. So on your day of, I said this yesterday, but as far as government is concerned, being on time is late and being early is being on time. Because even though your legislator might not be on time based on whatever they might be coming from that day, it's really important that you be on time and that they know that you might have been that you were waiting for them. Or if they're on time that you take this very, very seriously and you are ready exactly at 2.34 p.m., 8 a.m., whatever it is to talk about this issue. Make sure that you start off by thanking them for their time because this is there are a lot of things on that plate and on that schedule, but they have specifically made time to meet with you as a constituent and to make you a priority and make, make sure that find something positive in their record. If you're coming to your legislator, you've probably done a little bit of searching in one of the ways that we mentioned a couple of slides back. Maybe you've been following them on social media or you pulled their record. Maybe you've looked at some articles where they were reported out favorably for different votes that they did, but make sure that you note something from that because it will go a long way in letting that legislator know that you are a person that pays attention. You are a person that actually knows what they are doing. So you are a person that might be worth engaging even after this meeting because you are on the ball about what they are doing inside their office. And just because you don't know how long this meeting is going to be and even learning something you really want to look back, note that we gave you handouts. You should do the same thing with your legislators. Bring additional material, bring a one pager that they can share with other legislators or that they can share with their staff members. Bring something that they can take the time to peruse over outside of the 10 minutes that they may be meeting with you so that they can make a more informed decision about why you came there. And just a reminder, 
you should really come in with a super positive vibe because this is the last thing you guys have to do is actually really like have the meeting. So if you've already done all of this work that I've given to you, you've created your argument, you found your community, you found your resources, you've set the um, actual meeting, well, you should be in a great mood and you should go in there with a smile, a deep breath, sit up straight, and watch your facial expressions because I know it can be easy to, for your nerves to kind of play out on your face, but just remember that your legislator is also looking at your facial expression. So if you're saying something and you're nervous or you're just, you're looking down constantly, or you may have been scowling or your face is just turned down in a frown, even though you're saying something that you feel very passionately or strongly about, just to make sure that any, like any other time that you might be presenting, you're just going to keep a positive, like facial expression or you're going to smile and you're going to maintain really strong good eye contact with the person try not to rush or to ramble again a lot of this is a much much easier if you have created all of your uh, arguments ahead of time it can be easier to pick out inside of your brain exactly what you want to say to prove any point and you should be giving the other party meaning your legislator or staffer a little bit of time to talk to Let's say that you have 10 minutes for a meeting. You wouldn't want to prepare a 10 minute speech. You might want to prepare a five minute argument because the other five minutes, you want to spend an actual conversation with your legislator. I think this is maybe one of the number one things that people make mistakes about when they set these meetings is that they don't actually leave the space for there to be a conversation or there to be relationship building because there's a chance that your legislator is planning on voting a specific way and might have a re reason that they wanna share with you, or there might be a chance that they've never heard about this and they would like to ask you some additional questions so they can be better prepared for a decision that they might have to make in the future about it. It's very unlikely, unless this has been a very hot button issue that your legislator will give you a yes or no immediately inside that meeting. And it's just kind of one of those things that we all have to live with that there is a chance that the person who makes laws for your municipality or state will not make a decision in 10 minutes after they've met you. Don't worry. It's okay. There's lots of other people getting 10 minutes and there's lots of other handouts floating around to them to make these decisions. And what counts is that you had your 10 minutes, even if you didn't necessarily get the answer at the end of it. But again, leave that time for you to actually have a conversation in there so that you can learn a little bit more about each other, about the issue, and to build a relationship for the next time that you are going to come into that office to ask them to judge in a specific way. And again, as it says at the bottom, think conversation, not lecture. It's one of the easiest things to just pin in the back of your brain. Conversation, not lecture. So there are a couple things that you should do to make sure that you have the best outcome possible though after your meeting. And that includes our post-meeting follow-up. So more thank yous. I will never say that anyone can say enough thank yous. I can remember pretty clearly almost every single constituent that ever sent me a thank you email or a thank you card after an issue. And it was just because I get a lot of people who had, you know, concerns about things going wrong. So when something got fixed, a lot of people were like, good, the government is supposed to fix things and went on with their life. But people who actually came back to engage again, especially if they were going to be continuously engaging with me on an issue, I really did appreciate that. And I can tell you that any person in any office, anything that you do really does appreciate those little thank yous, especially if it's in a public serving. So make sure you re-engage after the meeting with that thanks for the time, but also restate those action items and timelines, especially if you got any promises whatsoever out of this elected or this staffer, you really wanna make sure that you restate that in an email back to them so that they don't possibly forget what they said inside of said meeting. Offer a great way to get in contact again, whether it's uh, adding a phone number or an email, or if you expect to see them on like a Zoom or a community meeting in the future, just to let them know, hey, I'm still out here and you can engage with me anytime that you would like to. And make sure you send that note in the next couple following days. It can either be right the day after or anytime probably that same week you should try for um, inside of like a five-day window and follow up on any outstanding issue items, especially if they 
ask you a question about anything inside of the meeting, make sure you find that answer and include that in your follow-up email to restate the fact that you were listening and that you were in conversation with this particular elected. If you get your issue resolved, congratulations. Maybe we should talk and you can train me. Um, but thank and acknowledge the person and make sure that the most important thing that you do is actually sharing your experience with others. This is old hat for some of you on this call, but it is 100% novel to other people who are on this training today because the act, the, Politicians look so powerful and legislators look so untouchable. But what everyone needs to remember is the only way that we will actually get any of the change that any of us are working for is through the advocacy of all, is for everyone to get on board and for everyone to feel prepared with the knowledge and skills and the comfort level to actually engage with these legislators to let them know that people are watching and if they are doing the right things and we're going to support them them if they are doing the wrong things, and we are certainly going to address it as constituents, as the populace, as advocacy people, and as organizers. Everyone has a role here in engaging and in advocating with their with the electeds to get some of the outcomes that we would like to see. So, last one: repeat as many times as necessary. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's 10. I feel like there are some things like, oh, let's say voter registration that I have been working on for long, 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 long time. I'm not saying that everything will be a decade battle. Some things will only be a week. But what's important is that you just keep staying engaged and that you keep repeating this and you bring as many people along as you possibly can every single time. So with that, we're, um, we're actually done with teaching you these ways for you to get at, um, get your advocacy up, for you to amplify your advocacy, get your message tight and get set those expectations for when you meet with those legislators, whether it's on Zoom or in real life, cross fingers for that to happen rather sooner rather than later. But I would like to stop the share so that I can take any questions that anybody might have except for all these questions that I'm now seeing in the chat about not being able to hear me, because sorry about that one, guys. <laughs> you can either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat if you do want to have any other questions about um, engaging, advocacy, or, oh, huh, thank you, Sheridan. <laughs> or anything else about um, your engaging with your electeds. Because again, I know that this can be, um, kind of awkward for people that have not called their legislator before, but it's really, really simple. And I'm talking that your beginning advocacy can be as simple as looking up that uh, information with your clerk's office and calling up your city councilor and saying, hi, I heard that this is how this vote went and thank you for voting this way. That's a great first step. Or you can go even further and do the essays and do the trainings and learn a little bit more and have those with full meetings. Um, all of these different levels of advocacy, all of these different uh, ladders of engagement are open to everybody. And it doesn't matter what rung you start on. All that matters is that you keep climbing <laughs> as you do so. Okay, so Maggie would like to know if there's any tips or examples on how to keep your messages and your issues tight. So if you're doing the, um, the activity from earlier today, what you're going to want to do is absolutely make sure that you keep that actually just to one page. Um, and you're going to keep that to one page, probably 12 font with no more than, no less than one and a half spacing. I know that there's some people who like to pull those margins all the way down to like 0.1 on each side and then pull it down to single spacing just so they can get all their words in. That's not this kind of exercise. <laughs> you're going to want to keep it to the one page because when you're forced to, if you're the part point of the original exercise is to not have any boundaries except for that small time boundary to not have any real boundaries about what you're doing. And when we move over to putting it into an essay format, it's to create structure to make sure that you stay very tight because um, you can, it's a lot easier to stay on message if you have to work inside of a parameter. So I would say the best way to stay on message is definitely to work inside of a parameter, whether it's I have only one minute to get this across or I only have three paragraphs to make this argument. 
and to stay inside of that. And then you'll start whittling away any extraneous fatty parts of what you want to say until you have exactly what's going to get the job done. And let's see, when you say share your experience, this comes from Lady Lawrence, do you mean sharing your experience about how to advocate or is there value in sharing the specifics of who contacted and outcome? 100%, I am actually saying both of those. So personal anecdotes are an excellent way for actually getting your, um, your point across if you have a personal anecdote related to that issue. And I say this because a legislator is that like from all sides, it's lobbyists, it's other legislators, it's the press, they may not even have heard from someone in their district who is personally facing whatever the uh, outcome of this vote could be. So your personal anecdote about anything is really going to go really, really, really far with changing someone's uh, viewpoint, especially with one of your actual legislators or your constituents. But there's also definitely value about sharing um, the who count who contacted and the outcome, because if you are in a issue advocacy and you are talking with other people who also care, um, particularly about housing, and you want to let them know how a meeting went, it's really going to help the entire movement by you sharing information. Movements move with transparency. When we have multiple organizations or people or groups who are all working and not telling anyone about what they're doing or what these meetings are like, then you can have a legislator having the same meeting and learning that they can use the same tactics over and over again. But if we actually share when we meet with people what actually happened and maybe what we might do differently or come with those people the next time, it's going to make for a stronger message overall for the entire movement. And that's what we always want to do is be in relationship with each other as organizers, activists, and advocates. I hope that answered your question. I mean, like, I really hope it because I'm, I'm looking at the time and running <laughs> really low on it. Okay, but was there anything else in this training that I could help you guys with right now, just as our last call before I might bring uh, Executive Director Zakem back on to close this out for the evening? Oh, okay, there is one real quick, real quick. Um, what is the value of constituent advocacy to a legislator or politician? It is literally everything. It is everything. I remember real quick, uh, I did a advocacy event with uh, State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, and she had mentioned how there was a bill, because they have hundreds and hundreds of bills, but there was a bill that she had not ever seen, but she had received received nine calls in one day, all different calls, not form calls, all different personal calls about this particular piece of legislation about adding a bittering agent to antifreeze so that children and animals didn't eat it. Now, of all the things that she had to look at, this had never even occurred to her, but those nine calls made her put a staff member on it to investigate it, to go to the person who had originally um, proposed the legislation, and then to actually sign on and champion it, all just because of nine people engaging with her office. It takes so little to create change, guys, which is why it's so important that you feel comfortable doing it, because sometimes... It's just those little things. And it really was because it was her own constituents, the people in her backyard who put her in that seat, having a feeling about it and letting her know what that feeling was that made her sign on to that legislation. So I cannot impress enough how important it is as a constituent for you to engage with these people when you're making decisions that affect everything in your life, guys. So I'm hoping that this training help you feel a little bit better about doing so. So now I will invite, Counsel I just called you Counselor Zakem, forever. <laughs> My forever executive director, counselor, candidate, everything you want to be, Zakem, <laughs> to go over here. Thank you, Kristen, for that uh, <laughs> introduction and all the titles. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. I hope you found it useful. I hope you'll stay in touch uh, with Housing Forward. We are going to share uh, these materials. The session recording will be posted on our website and we look forward to having more of these sessions and when we can all someday safe meetly, meet safely in person, uh, gather together to build a network, to build our community and our connections so we can all be effective advocates together. Thanks so much, have a great evening and uh, stay safe and happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>